Um, I've moved to this area about 11 weeks ago now. It seems uh, such a short time, but this time flies by. Um, having been a teacher, a head of art and craft design and tech for 28 years, and then retired now early for about 20 years with various problems, um, which has given me a lot of time to paint, to write, to make films. And I brought along a selection just for you to see there. That will also give you an idea of the sort of work I've been doing, because all of the films are diverse and about certain areas, so you might have the foundation to an area, foundation to pottery, foundation to pastels or whatever. But there are also the travel films I've just made. I'm going to show you some work here from Cuba, and this is a piece I'm going to do now is in Cuba as well. Um, where normally I work in situ, I like to work on plein air, on the site. It's more demanding, but you get so much more from it. Obviously you can't do it all the time, and when we're painting things like the figure there, or children or so on, it's more difficult. And to go straight into that, um, this is an oil over acrylic. That's an oil pastel on canvas. And I wanted to discuss with you that the, there's so many ways you can work, there's so much excitement you can have, there's so much fun you can have. And you know, part of this today is to get more inspiration, to get more fun, to more excitement, more arrows to your bow, to give you more techniques and more ideas to try out. The next one on was painted on plein air. And the figure, because my um, visual memory isn't that fantastic, I use a camera quite a lot, keeping one with me nearly all the time. And new digital cameras are lovely because you can bring up the image on the back of the camera. So if you've got a quick shot of a figure, you can then go back to your camera whenever you want, when you're still sitting there, and put in those figures you're taking, even though they've moved on. So that's quite a useful technique to bear in mind. I'm going to give you lots of tips today as well. The one on the right uh, is actually my fiancé posing. That's done in Aviron, and that's again painted on plein air. So one can paint quite large works very quickly with the techniques I'm using. Two to three hours I have to finish it for a large painting like that. And this is another reason for using acrylic sometimes underneath, because you can do an acrylic underpainting, which is dry within half an hour, and be onto it with the oils for your final bright coats within that half an hour afterwards. So, you know, just some ideas there, different ways of working. The, the oil pastels, again, I'm always experimenting because we have to find new ways to produce things. I've invented new ways of perspective. I've invented new ways of using... I was one of the first people to start using water with pastels and using pastels over acrylic inks. I'm going to show you some examples of those. And it's because of a need I had to do specific types of work. I wanted a very, very vibrant, bright way to paint flowers, far brighter than watercolour or, or up to oils. And uh, I started using acrylic inks and pastels over the top, which I'm going to show you. So we need to experiment and explore to move on. I knew one lovely chap in Bridlington, and I used to be with their art society. I, I painted and lived up there for seven years. And um, he was a millionaire, in fact. He used to let us use his hall, part of his own house. And his paintings went right the way around the wall over his life, basically, the ones he hadn't sold. And the problem for me was that you couldn't tell where they started and where they finished. He had not progressed in any way or form. Now, there's nothing wrong in that. There isn't sort of rights and wrongs in the art. There are things that don't work. But it was just a little bit sad. And you have to take risks. I think somebody else is just arriving. You have to take risks in art and sometimes make a mess to succeed. Yeah? Um, and it's only a bit of paper after all, for heaven's sakes. And I'm going to show you ways today that you can pull messes that you've made, that you can pull things back again and make a, a lost watercolour into something quite exciting with pastels and so on as well. So there's all sorts of things to pass on to you. Now, I have a whole website as well, so if you're conversant with um, the web, then my uh, details there have the site on as well. So you can look later on at the DVD, see what I've been producing, see where I've been going. They're three-hour to six-hour films. Normally, people produce films of 30 minutes. I don't. I produce whole long value for many things. So it's an idea there. Those are the films in learning how to paint or traveling and painting around the world or even in themes. And that's quite exciting for me because the filmmaking has actually become another part of my art. It gives another dimension to a painting. That when I do it, I'm not just doing this, and it will then be sold later, but people all around the world on YouTube, or when they buy the films, will see this being done, will see you guys. You know, it becomes another dimension to the artwork, which is lovely that so many people can enjoy it and share it, as we are now. It was a great pleasure to be here, and thanks for inviting me, but what I want to do is obviously introduce myself to you and, and, and get to know new friends myself. I'm only a little further along the path of painting and made a few more mistakes than you have in a few ways, and therefore I can show you some of those things that I've learned and those mistakes. You can avoid them, you can find new ways you can enjoy. So we're all artists here, uh, just at different uh, stages along, along the path. 
Um, so DVDs, the little leaflets about me, there's one there if you want to see that, where I am. I've opened up these studios at Thorpe. We've got some major events coming up. Uh, last night there was a meeting um, about the arts in the area. We've got a lady now in July going to be opening a vast event, the first of its kind, in Thorpe. Um, where we've got hundreds of stalls, stands, creative people coming. There's something to know that's being developed at the moment. There's lots of more arts going to be happening in this area, with the library going to be converted into a, a gallery in, in, in Mablethorpe, and so on and so on. So there's lots of linkages that they've asked me to join in with as well, which is rather exciting. Um, I'm also a member of um, the Open Studios. So my studio is open to the public. Again, it's on the websites and so on. Um, five or six times a year anyway, but any time anybody wants to come and use these gardens I'm developing, a little bit like a Monet garden, you are welcome to come, free of charge, just give me a bell, let me know you're coming, and arrive. And I'm not going to be treading on your feet or teaching you or doing anything else, you just come and enjoy the facilities, the greenhouse, all full of stuff, huge greenhouse, almost the size of this place, um, the gardens, and which we're really coming up with the flowers again, the fish ponds and so on. If you want to come as a group or individually and just relax and paint, have a picnic, that's fine by me. If you want help with tuition, then I do do lessons, as somebody already knows, who can slate me over it. Um, and I've been teaching for many, many years. Any medium, any style, I do not turn you into me. I don't ask you to think like this. If you see some of my stuff and say, I'd like to do that, that's fine. But I look at who you are and try to help you to develop where you need to be going. And this is the thing as a teacher, is to guide, to draw out of people what they're good at. There are three problems with that. One is you were told when you were a youngster at school that you were rubbish and it stays with you forever. The other is you have an older brother, sister who is much better than you uh, or a uh, husband or wife who uh, is totally opposite to your ways of thinking and maybe an engineer or photographer who's very detailed and you want to paint very loosely and that can be difficult. And then the, the last one of all, hi there, come and join us. Um, the last thing of all uh, is bad education is that you think a certain way of art or drawing is good and maybe it's not so good and maybe it's not even right for you. So if I get somebody who wants to paint very, very realistically but naturally they're an impressionist, it can be quite difficult for me as a teacher. I'll do what they want and I'll help them do as they want. There's no problem there. But it can be a shame for me to see people wasting what their natural ability is. So, you know, guidance is a thing there. So hopefully today I'm going to show you a lot of different ways of working, explain a lot of little things that go on as I'm doing it, even how I travel and the sort of paints I carry and what happens. Uh, give you some advice on materials, new techniques, and uh, simple little things like, you know, if you want to do a glaze or a wash that's going to remain on your paper and work over it, and you don't want that glaze to lift, you add a little bit of acrylic medium to your water. That you want a bit more depth in your watercolour, you add some more gum arabic, because all it is is very fine pigment mixed with gum arabic, so you add a bit more and it gives more depth. When you're using pastels, you've got lots of bits of old broken pastel or dust at the end. Save it all, put it in a bag. Later on, mix it with some water into a paste, roll it into a sausage, let it dry, instant pastel. Don't waste them. It's as simple as that, soft pastels. There are tons and tons of tips. And I've given your, um, your boss, chef de la, des arts ici, um, a, a series of um, helpful notes there. The basic foundations in watercolour oils and pastels giving you a lot more techniques than you may have realised, giving you the terms of those and the basic do's and don'ts as in baking a cake. Because you know how to make a basic cake, most of you. You know, the things to put in the amount that makes it taste good. We can talk about a painting having a foreground, a middle distance, a distance. You can talk about a painting having warms and cools to play one against each other. Roughs and smooth, lights and darks. We can have the um, uh, aerial perspective, which is the colour in perspective, as well as linear perspective. Um, we can have the details in the foreground, as in a photograph, focus and gradually go lighter in the background. And there are all sorts of permutations. Some of the style I'm going to show you, I was taught in New Zealand by an artist there. We kindly invite me to the studio. And this is where I was introduced to these brushes. And if you just feel that, it's neither soft nor hard. It's a beautiful semi-stiffness. And that is a very, very useful series of brushes for doing dry brush work, which is what he did. Now this particular guy paints the little details first and then paints very loose watercolour around it, whereas we're always trained to do you know, the, the loose and tighten up gradually, aren't we? Mm -hmm. um, and also this worry of how to paint figures or dogs suddenly into a painting, you see somebody painting, it starts like a sore thumb. Um, the, the, the figure. This one is acrylic ink with a little gouache and pastel over the top because I wanted to capture the modern, bright um, and loose way of those catamaran sails and the intensity of light 
um, from the uh, from the sun in Cuba. This one, though, uh, I, I actually drew it out and put the masking fluid on the day before. It then came down in torrential rain at the very end of my holiday for three days. So I finished both of these in the bedroom at the end. That one I taped to my suitcase to paint it because I only had one drawing board with me. So you have to make do, don't you? And this one I finished by using the back of the camera and the shots I'd already taken. So when you're going outside painting, it's always worth having a little digital with you to be able to get those shots in case things go wrong and you've got to make a run for it. One little amusing tale I've told you before um, is I was painting out in the middle of a field in uh, Yorkshire, up, up in, yes, not far from uh, Bridgerton, and I've got this archetype, almost constable uh, scene with um, the cows are going around this church in the background and so on, and I suddenly realised I was surrounded by these cows and one of them was a bit bigger than the rest. And, it was like, <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm thinking, oh dear. Um, uh, what do I do here? And you know, I know cows have a panache for wanting to eat my paint. I mean, the Labrador's been and painted the room by hitting the tail on the on the Prussian blue and then going whack 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 around the wall. But different story. Um, but this large bull was thinking of doing something, so I thought, well, you know, what the hell do I do here? I was too far away with all my gear to make a run for it. it wouldn't be wise anyway. So uh, I won't do this to you, make you suffer. But I decided the best thing was to to really act cool and start to sing an Irish song. And the whole herd of cows moved to the other side of the field. But it says something about my singing, I think. But anyway, uh, if you ever get stuck with a bull in the field, I try, try an Irish song. Normally, if there are cows in the field, the bull is all right. Normally, it's well, when the bull is by itself. I was going to say, sometimes this, people say the opposite because he's protecting the cows, but you know, you get different yeah, stories, don't you? Yeah. But anyway, whatever, he went away, but my singing was <laughs> enough for him, and I finished the painting. That one is done for Ron Manson style, so we've got the masking fluid done first and then using a hay brush, building out the background wet into wet and gradually over the whole picture, keeping it going all at once, um, tightening up, tightening up until you're working wet over dry. There's the various simple techniques, standard techniques of watercolour. I like to try and keep a painting going all over at once if possible, unless I'm doing a specifically different style. In this case, I'm going to paint tight at first and do that New Zealand technique. So I'm going to paint my details first and work to looser at the end, very, very loose at the end. This one again, to get the effects of light. Um, I've done a series of oils, I say, but the morning light, this one's called, and just use it wet into wet effects and again, gradually tightening up just a little bit of masking fluid. So something again, I want to show you things that are very, very different. This one, watercolour pencil. A lot of cross hatching and just blending with a brush to get the gentle, gentler tones. Not something I do a lot of, but when I do these films, like I said, I was doing, in this case, it was the, these two were part of the series of painting figures in, in flowers in the garden. So I was showing as many different techniques uh, as I could. Water, yes, so watercolour pencil and blending with water as you go along. So you can work in, work on, work under, you know, keep going until you're finished with it. Something I would say about pen and ink as well, that um, I prefer personally, if I'm doing pen and ink, to do my pen and ink first and then the wash at the end. Because if you do it the other way around, you find you get like a chicken going around in it. Now, mixed media, one of my series of looser ones. This one is a straight watercolour, York scene, painting in the way I'm going to paint in a minute, but with more limited colour. That one is acrylic inks, which are very strong, and then pastel just to finish it off. And if you paint very loosely like that, sometimes you get such a lovely abstract, you don't even want to put the pastel on. But it just tightens it up and pulls it together. Again, back in Cuba, sitting there on fly air, painting in traditional watercolour. Again, what I want to show you, why I want to show you this one was to show you the difference in these, these colours. This is that limited palette I'm about to use. And then the bright Mediterranean type colours you can get even with watercolour. Watercolour doesn't have to be dead, dull and you know, inert. Ron Ransom once quoted, why do people have to paint watercolours as if they've got gauze over them? You know, you don't have to be wishy-washy, they can be quite strong and vibrant. China graph pencil and watercolour. So China graph pencil first to get the details and it will soak in the paint. I don't mm -hmm. use black in my palette. I don't use it in watercolour, I don't use it in oils unless for a specific uh, purpose. I'll use it in a limited palette of the earth colour, say a Rembrandt palette, where I actually make the black look blue and to make a black it becomes black and burns, uh, burns under. Different story again but there are you know, permutations of using colours. But a nice way to work and in this case, because the paint soaks just into those blacks, it will tint them enough to take away that sooty effect of black. This is the demo I did uh, last week for the snow scene. Again, three mediums, the China graph pencil, 
um, watercolour and then some pastel to finish off, soft pastel to finish off. And this is what I'm talking about when I say if you've got a watercolour that fails, you can bring it back by tinting pastel over the top. Choice of paper is important as well. Um, you'll notice on that one, that, that was a hot press, 140 arches. This is a knot, uh, no sorry, this is a rough. And I'm using that surface of the paper to scumble the pastel over. So here you've got a smooth area where it's just watercolour for the sky. And where I wanted more texture, then I've got the pastel just scumbling over the watercolour at the end. Yeah. When you use pastel, I mean, very often with, with watercolour, um, past, what happens, does it not smudge and powder, or does the watercolour actually bind Right, it? a couple of things. If you actually paint with the, with the um, I've got one of those here, I've got one here. Yeah, if you actually paint with the, with the, with the pastel, which I haven't got one of, I don't think one of those, you can actually paint with pastel with water. You can, I, mean, I, you I do a lot of that. Where water you put the water on the paper, oh, put the pastel yeah, in, pastel. or better still, put the pastel on and then blend in with the water. Now, this is useful in many ways because um, if you want something very, very fine, like twigs and branches, and you've got a very heavy unison pastel, then you can actually draw that branch out from the heavier trunk with a wet brush. So you can actually mix it on the paper and draw it out. You can mix the paint on the paper. Once the pastel has been with water and is dry, it's fixed. So ah. it will take more, this is your question. Yeah. I'll get there in the end, don't worry. The, 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 you can then put more over more easily at the end. Now, pastel works, as you're probably aware, by it reflecting the light on the little tiny particles. Yeah. So if you do the old-fashioned blocking and blending, as Asherton Stone does, love, 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 pastel painter, then the blocking and blending is dead. It's the second and last colours that you must not touch. And this is why I don't use fixative as well, because it brings it down two tones. And if you double mount, usually the stuff doesn't come away. As long as you don't accidentally drop the paint into its front, and then you know, there's a problem, but it's going to happen. Um, so, yes, fixed won't just have water. You can, uh, you can work over the top, or you can just even blend a little bit of the pastel into a watercolour, or you can just put it directly on yeah. and leave it alone. So, you know, it's completely up to you. Uh, this is what we're doing today, then. This is one done with the same palette a couple of weeks ago, some oxen, uh, again, in Cuba. So that's what the problem we're going to have today, is to work loosely. Um, if you start loose, you can finish tight. If you start tight, you can't go loose. It's very hard to go back and loosen it up or put loose work over it. So start loose and gradually get tighter and tighter, and then you are in control and you can stop whenever you want. It's also a bit like baking a jigsaw. If you put the right colours in the right tones, relative to each other, in the right places, the picture will just appear like a jigsaw. So we need to keep all the colours going relative one to another. It's no good just painting one bit and saying that's finished, because it may be totally wrong to something else. You have to try and keep these colours related one to another. I'm going to just start off with a very thin wash of this um, raw sienna, just to get a yellow going there. It's got a slight green tint to it. I'm going to let the paper show quite in places at times. I want a slight touch of um, my ultramarine blue just coming in there. Just to grab, I'm going to feel my way at first and I'll get faster as I go along. Feel my way up through there. It's got some tones and some, some uh, tones going in that. Just letting that wet do the work. Keep it simple. Almost one stroke painting. Keep it nice and light and simple. There's a touch of warm in that, so I'm going to build actually up on the paper itself. I'll get some um, tissue for myself. It's not here in case I've got an emergency, don't worry. <laughs> right, let's put that to dry my brush on. So back now to the face. And I'm just going to tint in a touch of the burnt sienna across the face. Fairly dark here. But it's far too bright like that, but it'll give you an idea of how these colours will work together. And into that, take some of the ultramarine and just let that spread out on the left, ever so simply. Well, I've got that dark colour there, still working on her. Bring that down right through into here. She's, actually, she's got to run. And now I'm just coming through there. I'll just indicate, just indicate. Well, I, all I want at the moment is an effect of light. I just want to get the effect of light for this. And down to my pressure <coughs> right here. Up through there. And that figure is basically there. We, I'm not going to go into dotting I's and crossing T's. I can go you know, more and more into detail as I go along. So I'm going to play rough against smooth, light against dark, cool against warm, ever so simply. 
right into here to indicate a bit of hair going down the back there. So just one little stroke like that, that's all I need. And let's just treat the rest in the same way, nice and loose. I could be using a saw brush for this, but I've decided to use a round at the moment. Um, very, very pale, cool colour going on down him. So again, we'll put a little wash of this <coughs> ultramarine. There are so many ways we can work and use watercolour, and other things as well. And uh, while I'm there, I'll just put that dark in his head. Let's go back to the warm. Keeping it simple, don't start painting too much detail, don't need it. Just keep things simple at first. I need to a little bit into motor effects, warmer down the back. So a lot of these colours are very, very close. A little bit of um, yellow going through his arm. I'm painting in a fairly controlled and detailed way at the moment. But let's not get too tied up with that. And then on the top of the arm, now obviously you know with watercolour, um, I'm working on the vertical, so things are going to do that. If I wanted to paint a lovely sky, I'd like to be painting it and then moving it around, putting it flat, tilting it, whatever. Um, in this case, I'm painting on the vertical so you can see what I'm doing. There's darks in again. That <coughs> now, negative shapes. A negative shape is a dark against the light. So in watercolour, we're working almost entirely in the negative shapes. We're working um, our darks around our light colours. While that's drying off, we'll just indicate a little bit of texturing on his coat there. It's a bit cool at the back. So as simple as that, again, I'm going to put a bit darker down his arm there. I can always darken down later. Let's, let's just um, find my lights and darks here at the moment. Uh, this is a lovely dark a block of dark colour going on there. It starts off with a cool, it starts off with a blue, coming all the way down. I could paint in almost any style you wanted, but I thought it would just be rather fun today to do something that looks or is fairly complicated, but if we treat it in this way, it takes away all that fear and panic of having to paint this figure and that figure and get these effects. Mix up now some dark. I'm going to use some of the ultramarine and uh, the sienna. Go quite dark down to it, but really spread down in those areas. So a lot of it is in timing too. Um, it's just step by step by step. There's only some feel to it, um, especially with using a brush with oils, is not painting, you know, being able to put fat over lean paint, in other words, paint delicately on top of a surface and keep putting paint on. That is feel and that is practice. Um, but with watercolour, it is one medium where you've got to practice and, you know, you've got to keep in practice as well. A bit dark around his head there, now I've got that one. It's still wet, so we're controlling this, these accidents here and let that come all the way down through here. Just let that blend into, into that area there. And there, down. That, that is a negative shape around this right hand figure so that he stands out. Just right up and through, even up to there and behind him slightly. It's a little bit lighter there than his head. And while I've got that dark on there, I can still come and do a little bit more work on here and just some of that patterning around on his shirt. Just indicating it. As easy as that. A bit darker there now. <coughs> so I'm giving an illusion. I'm letting you do the work. Don't try and paint everything for everybody. Let them imagine. Let them do some of the work in this. Let's go down there now. Put it dark in there. Down into there. I'm using my darks, I'm going straight in with these darks now. And it's very dark down in there. And we get the illusion of these figures in the background. We're not painting every detail. There's a little bit of light left on that edge. So I'll just go fairly carefully around that bit. We just need a little bit of light to tint in later. I'm not using masking fluid. So I want to leave a little bit of the edge of that one there. And remember that we can lift out whenever we want as well. That, I'll do that in just a second and lift a bit of paint out just to remind you that if you make a mistake, you can go back and you can still lift out. I don't want to leave too much white paper showing that I can do lovely dry brushwork like that, but I don't want to get into that yet. Um, I'm going to use that dry brushwork towards the end. Just a bit more in those darks. 
Uh, this is this is the slog for me, and this is this is the hard work. Um, we come into the of that. Um, the looser work towards the end. Now the reins on the horse, I could have done with masking fluid. I'm going to possibly flick those back in later. I'll just leave a little bit of indication of where they are there. Um, I'll possibly flick those in later with um, some light gouache. I, I think I'd be allowed to cheat on that a little bit today. And I'm going to now do some blending. So I'm going to paint three areas here of darks. One, two, three, because there are lights in between on those, and down here a bit as well. Let those dry slightly whilst I'm waiting. So I'm going to let those dry just slightly, come back into here, but a very dark warm, just on the back into there. So subtle changes. And the horse comes in here. Dark area there, the horses are a little bit <coughs> between. A little bit of that rain just showing there. Clean the brush. And we've got two ways of blending. We can paint wet next to wet, let them come in. We can paint wet into wet. We can paint wet next to dry, which gives us a hard edge. Or we can do what I'm doing now, and whilst it's still just damp, put some clean water on and let them blend together to give a soft edge. So all these watercolour techniques that are standard you can use. Come down to the horse. It's nice and dark here. But we've got some light areas left there that I need to tint, so I'll come back onto those. Just leave those white at the moment. And I'll come in with the same sort of technique in just a moment. Put a rain coming up there. Now that's drying off there. If I wanted to indicate at this stage, before it's too dry, like getting cauliflowers, I could now just come back into that while it's still just soft enough and just put a little bit more dark in there to give more illusion of these figures that are in there. Just with a few brush strokes like that. Keep it simple. It's dark here. It's light, just coming into there. Just keep that light. Dark down below. Let that flood in. Get these controlled accidents in watercolour. You know, they are accidental, but you're using those accidents, you're controlling them. And again, that's where the, the practice comes in, to play around on paper with watercolour, to gradually get it right. There we go. Let's have a look at these wheels while I'm at it. Just want to paint them in so simply and so quickly. Don't fiddle about. Just one stroke in. Don't worry if it's slightly off. Don't worry about that. And then through there. So sword brush again, very useful for this as well. Just to indicate all these mechanics underneath. And that central piece there, the hub, and just a couple of... I don't mind painting these details now. I'm going to do such a quick dry brush wash that um, it shouldn't lift this. That paint should hopefully stay in place when I do the wash. So I'm painting, in this case, the opposite way around to the way you probably normally do it, because I'm painting details first. So if you're doing a very busy street scene like that York scene I showed you earlier, this is a great way to do it, where you can paint your figures in fairly loosely, very you know, single strokes most of the time, um, and then gradually tighten up to where you want to go to and you finish when you're ready. Negative shape. Negative shape, letting those two figures stand out. 
little bit more detail there again. And I'm just going to get a bit darker down that line before that comes up. Let's go back now to the GG. Can you, excuse me? Yep. Can you just give us the odd quick glimpse of the picture as you're doing it? That you're working from? Oh yeah, sure. Just so yeah, we can yeah. sort of compare yeah. what you're doing. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, fine. How good your eyes like? <laughs> Should we have a second one? Well, look, if I pass that one over, that's the other one. Yeah, you can so keep that back there. You can see what I'm up to without, yeah, you know. Thank you. Okay. Um, right, this top is a fairly cool, with a little touch of the sienna coming into it. So, again, I'm going to start off with a wash. I'm going to let a little bit of dry brush work just go over the top there. So now I can come into that and take a little bit of the sienna, warm it up a fraction, and we'll just let the wet into wet do the, the mottled effect on top. Yes, any questions you've got as I go along or anything? I mean, if, even if it's not relevant to what I'm doing, if you've got any other questions about art or painting and something that you, you know, want to know or can help with, just ask me when I'm whittling away here. What I do find with, with doing painting films is that I tend to um, talk as I'm going, and it makes it much easier for editing because I only normally talk to myself doing a painting when there's an important bit going on. <laughs> so when I look at the timeline and I see all the little bits of voice, I can say, cut that bit out and cut that bit out, but nothing's happening really there. It makes it really easy for editing. Right. Now it's not going to flow upwards much, so I'm actually quite safe here to come in and paint this dark line along the bottom here because it'll only, it'll only spread upwards a fraction. It's going to drop down, if anything, by gravity. So let's get some nice effects there. And just finish off across at the edge. Right. Now I need to soften this and just just by dragging the paint across it, I can take that white down a bit. Same here and there. There's the sparkles of white. If I don't want them, I can take them down. So that's painted that fairly simply. Come back to the horse and, and the lady. I, want, I think I'm going to put the, the light area of the lady in this area here now. She's got a warmer tint there, and then she's got cooler going on around the outside. But it ranges from a very slight yellow up into the, the pink. So we'll come up there with a little bit of yellow and then a touch of the so we don't get your paint going to get water getting too messy. So warmer up into there, that's the sunlight and shadow. Remember that shadows are light, are warm and cool as well. If, like the impressionists, you, you ban pure white and black from your palette because there has to be light, then you'll realise that in daylight Wherever there is light, it's going to reflect the colour. So if these are a pink or yellow light, or it's a sunlight or blue light from outside, then you can never have white paper, because it has to be having a tint of some colour, doesn't it? And the same with the blacks. Um, darks will always have some sort of light, unless your eyes are totally closed and you put your hand over there. You can't have total black. Can't it? just doesn't happen. So I'm always getting some sort of colour going on here. Is coming around there. So if her, if she's, if she's uh, a white shirt on in this case, then the <coughs> white shirt is going to be reflecting underneath this shade. And a little bit darker. While it's wet into wet, while I want those effects, a little bit darker along the top edge there. This is this top edge here and then down the side. Very difficult to do this from life. I mean, you have to. I, mean, I have got techniques for painting figures in very quickly. That's where the sword brushes come in. Right back to the the arms and the uh, flesh tones. That arm is very very dark. I'm going to come in with a quite a strong sienna at first and drop into the dark colour in just a moment. And this her hair is a very dark warm at first. And I'm going to drop dark colour into there in just a moment again. <coughs> Again, timing, you've got to be careful 
as to just what is going to run into what underneath. And that colour actually will come all the way down, in this case for her, for her leg, and it will bring that all the way down through the leg. A couple of simple strokes, same here, just on that edge. Then some clean water, and we'll just thin that in, as easy as that. Let that dry just slightly because I don't want it all running down that leg. I'm going to go back up now with that dark colour, my Prussian and the... Um, um, in my case, I have my favourites I use most, but they all get used eventually for some sort of purpose. So, and there. Keep it simple again. <laughs> What type of crystals are you using, are they? They're artificial sables. I haven't yet found, because the artificial sables now are so good, I haven't found the need to buy real sables, lovely as they are, but they're so expensive. Um, on these rounds, these are nylon, as you've just felt just now. Artificial sable again here. So they're all nylons of some variety. As I say, they, they make them so well now that I don't really think it's um, like a man with his golf clubs, isn't it? Well, it's a nice thought to have something expensive and you feel it, but when I've been hard pushed, I've actually drained petrol from the petrol tank in my car to paint with, if I've run out of turps. You know, needs must. It's like doing that painting on the suitcase when I was in Cuba. You, you know, you just have to make do. Um, okay, I'm I've got to be, bear in mind your cup of tea time, you see, as well. <coughs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. yes, we, so we just indicate a few marks there. I could put this in fancy in. He's definitely not Paul. Yeah. I know the problem here. Yeah. That's why I'm sitting painting that I can't stand for long periods. Right, that's all we need for that. Now this car here, how simply can we paint the car in the background? We're going to make an, an, an indication of this car. That's what we're going to do. A little tiny car there, yeah, with the little white headlights gleaming and the bumper just gleaming white in between. It should be a classic car. It is. In fact, they are over there. Yeah, on the film, you see My daughter went and she said the classic cars are the things. They are. Yeah, it is fantastic that. They don't get lost, do they? Well, they keep them going. Well, they look after the. It's like washing machines. I mean, on that film, I went to see a local person, invited me to see their house. And they've got to keep the washing machines going forever. These antique washing machines, you know, they buy one, it's going to be for life. It's not just throw away as we do here. So just indicate a car back there. That's what we're going to do. So now, back to the water, in the brush, and we'll just let that blend in give an indication of something lighter there. Perhaps a little touch of touch more blue into that as well. You can drop these colours in as you go around. Warm against cool, light against dark, rough against smooth. So I'm tempted to start doing dry brushwork. I love dry brushwork. I can see that as I go along here as I'm doing this, you can see uh, the, p the potential for doing that. Just to indicate the shapes there and then come in with the water afterwards again. So if we can handle a few colours successfully, then obviously we can move on to using lots of colour. If you're having a job to even paint with a couple of colours, it may be a good exercise to do. And it does give a nice coherence. I mean, the less colours you use, usually the more coherence you have, rather than something standing up like a sore thumb, you something put in that, you know how bad Elizabeth and Crimson is, and Viridian Greens, and the Prussian Blues, and so on. You know, if you don't use them in the right way, it can be lethal. Whereas uh, painting with a limited palette like this. Could you do the same with acrylics? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, and in fact, 
like I said, the limited palette, if you took as a limited palette for fun, burnt sienna, raw sienna, burnt umber, raw umber, white and black, then you will find that with those colours only, painting very carefully, you can make the yellow ochre look like lemon yellow, <coughs> you can make the burnt sienna look like cadmium red, and black would be um, the burnt umber and the black to make it warmer, which would then make the black seem cooler because of the warmth in the other. Green would be raw umber, because raw umber compared to the burnt umber is greener. And you can actually paint a lovely picture or portrait just using those few colours. It really pushes you, but it's good fun. Mm. <coughs> Ever so carefully, but to really work it all out. And I'm doing a little bit here, you can see I'm, I'm gradually adding the warms and you know, subtle warms and cools here. Um, so I'm putting some more warming there now and darkening it down. Right, back into that again, and I'm going to put a little bit of blue onto my brush before I go in this time, just a thin bit, and I put the water over right here, a bit bluer, down there, and then I'm going to put No, I am mixing here as well. I mean, there's the, the, the such subtle mixes that you hardly see me doing it. I'm mixing on there because I'm dropping in, but I'm also, I mean, I just put some more sienna into that deep blue there. If I was doing a full palette painting, you'd see me mixing a lot more. Um, but because it's such a limited palette, this, um, there's not so much going on in that way. Is that the big word, don't you? Is that yeah, it's a very rapid way of working. This is, uh, this is the beauty of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's most of my actual detail done. I don't need to paint in much more detail at this stage. So I can start to have fun now. You're not. I must admit, you horse looks better painted than it did before. Sorry? Your horse looks better painted than it did before. Better, better, yeah, yeah, it was looking a bit like an old... Well, they're such old men, they're nags, that they don't look after the horses very well. You've got these huge heads and these scrawny bodies on them, you know. They look like greyhounds, some of them. Yeah. Right, we're going to paint this very, very loosely back here. Let's, let's start with the tree. I'm going to, again, drop in on it. But there's also some quite nice texturing on that. So, let's see what we can get in the way of texture with our... Should we use a sharpen by now? <laughs> Thank you. Big brush, straight in, enjoy. Again, a bit of warmth. So I'm just letting the brush touch the surface of the paper slightly sideways on here. Then I'll start adding in the cools. Some nice, we let some ultramarine come in now. Ultramarine is our, is our main blue. We're using the other as the darker colour, really more for mixing them. And let's have a look at the cool on the path. Loose. You can see just how loose I'm. You know, yeah, it's a beautiful way to work. There are just so many wonderful things you can do in painting, so many ways you can work with paint. I'm just showing you. A style now. Mm. 
I know you're painting loosely, but you're not painting terribly wet, are you, that it's running down the No, um, we've done the wet into wet. If I did, it would be flooded everywhere. I don't need to in this particular painting. Um, I will be going much wetter up here in a minute. Um, but no, much of, most of this is going to be using dry brushwork now and uh, setting initial glazes and then washes and then working um, dry brush and glazes over the top of that. So here, warm in the background. Just to get rid of the white paper, tint it. So you can just flick across, if you're quick enough, you can flick across these shapes without losing too much, even though you've got a little bit of lifting going on. Um, Not to worry about it. So I want my initial warm wash or glaze between around here, which I'm going to come into afterwards with um, stronger, heavier colours. Let's look at more. Yellow going on over there. If we want a very bright sunlit effect, then obviously the tones are quite strident and strong in between. If we wanted a, a, a misty grey day, well obviously then we're going to have colours that are a lot closer. But in this case, if I want to keep the effects of sunlight, I've got to try and keep um, quite strong lights and darks. Look into these now. I do want to lose that dry brush altogether there, I just want to. All of that is in shadow. Right down each side of that corner. Put a lift out. So dry your brush off. You've got a colour in the wrong place. You can just lift it out with a, a dry brush. Locking it in, I'm not going to fuff about with details, we're just going to indicate what's going on back here and let the eye do the rest of the work, making a nice, busy, simple. And it's so much more refreshing and relaxing painting like this and having to try and paint every figure in our numbers. see things are starting to flood about a bit now because I'm getting far more water on now so I can sort of start on the vertical I'm going to start controlling it around the place. Again if I want that lighter there, lift it up. These dark areas back here, now let's have a look at them so we can do that. And they've got a cooler area in the centre. And then they get quite dark and warm. Oops, got a dribble going down there. I didn't catch it before it gets anywhere.
you make it look so easy. Mm. It's a lot of practice to do, but you know, it's one of those things where you've really got to relax to be able to do it. Just indicate things. I'm just indicating. I'm not trying to paint every detail, and it's giving an illusion of. Yeah. How come your dark colour didn't run out then into the light colour that you've only just put on? What there? Yeah. It's, it's timing. It really is. It was trying to earn it, and I've got things dripping around here, but. It's just trying to get that timing so it's just dry enough to know, you know. This is why I say you know, I can teach you other, the other things step by step. The watercolour I can show you, but you're going to have to practice and play with it and see. Heavy paper like this soaks in very quickly as well. Yeah. So, you know, heavy rough paper is giving, giving me the texture and... same way as I'm putting that on now, I know it's all wet, if I just do a little bit like that, I know it's going to spread out and just give the effect of the bars on the window. Any wetter it would spread too far, so it's just timing, isn't it? Do you sort of vary that according to what paper you're using? To a degree, a bit of watercolour, it's everything, isn't it? I mean, um, even, even the water can change things. When I've been painting up in Scotland and using river for, water from the stream, so it's softer. Um, lots of little things, atmosphere, dampness of the day, humidity. The worst time I had was painting where the film for Sherlock Holmes was made and the huge <coughs> waterfall that cascades down where the yeah. Moriarty fought. Mm -hmm. And my painting was just dis disintegrating down the paper. There was so much humidity and spray I had to go away that it dry off and come back again because it was impossible to paint. So that's getting a bit too wet now. I've got to leave that area to dry off a bit now. Whereas this one's a little bit drier there. I can just come in there a bit more and indicate things on there. <coughs> Laying these lights against darks again, these negative shapes in here. Just indicating things in. No, not precise. No, we're not, I'm not doing a photograph here. I'm, doing a painting and it's in a style and it's stylized. Mm. So I'm just playing with these. Mm. Yeah, you'll finally come up. Not my impression is works. When you get up to them, they're just blobs of paint. But <coughs> I then stop when I want. I can go as photographically real. I can carry on with this. I could work into this until it just became a photograph. That's what I wanted. <coughs> Yeah, it's, it's, I know these are things that um, looking at it from such a distance. Yeah. 
I like to get back to something. When I'm doing a big oil painting like those, this is why I use long handed brushes. I'm out here fencing because I can see what I'm doing. Here I'm working up tight, it's not so easy for me. But just to say, just to give you the, the techniques. Do you think that makes you tighter? Being closer, well, yeah. 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 Yes. I can't um, just indicate things in. Right, move on to a, a flat. Yeah, back to my burnt sienna now, because I want some of the more warms going on, more of the brick colours going on in the background here. Yes. This is burnt sienna now. I'm just it is sienna. Yes. Yeah, burnt, I've got raw sienna and burnt sienna. So the two siennas, the raw sienna, the burnt sienna, and the two blues, the Prussian and the ultramarine. So a brush for the job. The basic rule is, no golden rules, but the basic rule is start with your largest brushes and finish with your smallest. I'm not going to say you have to do it this way, you have to do it. Some of the students have come to me and, oh God, they've had terrible teachers that have been so uh, despotic, you know, you had to put a wash on with a brush left to right only, you know, that sort of stuff. No, no. There's no real ruling like that, it's just whatever works for you. Some people think they are. Yeah, oh yeah. But, you know, if, you, if something works for you, do it. That's why I say with the mixed media, people have been, it's only in the last 10 or 15 years that people have really opened up to mixed media. You know, it's been considered, no, it's not too fair, it's not, uh, you can't use gouache, oh no, you know, you've got to stick to the masking fluid, you've got to, you've got, you've got to, it's whatever you want. to stay at home, do you? Yeah. No. So this shows out more here on that column. Okay. Mm -hmm. Last hour or so, rather than have a big white area here, I'm going to deliberately reflect just slightly down into here. And you know, I'm the artist. I'm not stuck by this um, photograph, or I can put in what I want, how I want to get the effects I want. 
So dry brush there, and then if it's reflecting, of course, we're going to have, we had this with Kathy the day, didn't we? Mm. Reflecting in the water. You know, the verticals in water first, and then the horizontals afterwards, or lifting out afterwards. Mm. And a great, great way to paint water. Mm. So we'll do these verticals first, and then I shall just go across it a with a, a few marks to um, just feel Still, still working here, the dry brush across. Maybe there's a bit of dirt or bits of dark in the foreground, just little bits of stuff to catch the eye. Is that a neat paint you've got there? Not quite, no, it's, it's almost, but um, I'm going darker and darker, a bit of go across that, but you get just so loose you get used to. Sort of feel those brickwork, the rockwork there a bit more. But I, I am getting towards heavier and heavier paint now, yes, because I'm working into the darks. So you're quite right in saying that. But so what I wanted to show you was this lovely loose way of, of working, and you can go tighter and tighter. Again, if you make a mistake, come back, clean water best you can, and you can just lift something out. Dry your brush, the water, lift it up. Now it's, it's just a matter of just tickling in little bits and pieces, you know, just feeling my way. As, as a loose painting, you've got to know when to stop, especially with a watercolour. If you keep tickling and tickling and tickling, you overdo it. If you do, you can still come back with some pastel and um, touch up some of those areas that have been overworked. And if it's wet, I guess the horse is going to be reflecting slightly too, so we're going to have a bit of something going on from the horse here too. You know, for a loose painting, I'm almost done. I, if I keep working, actually, I've got to uh, get that drawing of that neck a bit. Over there a bit more. Not taking about three weeks. <laughs> and you can do any scene in this loose sort of work. Did you discuss what you're doing? Oh yeah. Does anybody? Have you can talk any time you like. I mean, I say I'm almost done now. What well, I think it is. Yeah. There's so much we can talk about, there's so many hints I need. I'm just sort of tight. What you just asked questions while well, I'm just finishing this off then. And, um, Does anybody want to ask any questions? I'm just wondering about those people in the, um, sitting in the Here. Which will they fall out? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all one block. I mean, is it? Oh. if you look at the photograph here, let the people looking at it do the work. A little bit darker. Fine. They've got no health and safety over there. No. Well, yeah, <laughs> no, that's the point. The old training one time was incredible. I mean, it wouldn't, uh, the traps and the sleepers are probably. They're just textbooks, you know. I always have real problems with masking fluid. Right. What's that stuff that you use? So this, that's those other bottles are the problem. Yes, it is, isn't it? It's all hard, the lids crack, and it all's up inside the jars yeah. and so on. It's, oh, yeah. it's not good news, really. With, no. Can you come up to the dimension? Go now, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. Again. Yeah. Then I could mix some PVA medium, yeah. acrylic medium, acrylic medium with uh, that paint. Mm -hmm. And like acrylic inks, when it dries, it's not going to be, you can't get it off, you can't move it, you can't lift it. So if you wanted to do a very thin wash that's still porous, a little bit of acrylic medium with the preliminary washes, and then you can work in them as much as you want, and they won't lift, they won't codify, they won't do anything, they'll stay, you know, little tricks like this that are just technical things. There are occasions when really you really want something just to cover, just a little bit more. Well, lift. Lift yeah. or nice. shine or... Well, there you are. That, that's when you'd add in a bit more galanovic. Yeah. Well, little jars, you know. Yeah. This is... It's all, it's all, all watercolour, is I, I do sugar flowers and I've got galanovic for mixing in. It's dry paste, though. You'd have to 
Yes, normally the gum are a bit weak. Because you're going to make... Right, and, and now the signatures, I mean, it's a bit of a bugbear of mine, but and I can keep working, it's a bit longer. But the signature is a part of the painting, for heaven's sakes. And, you know, people start... You need to practice your signatures. Let's get something a bit slicker. There's nothing worse than putting a signature in the wrong place in the composition, or the wrong colour either. In this case, it's easy for me because I've got a lovely big space there. But it wants to flow and practice the signatures first, because something a bit classier, and decide what colour as well. If I put something cool here, is it going to sink back? If it's warm, is it going to jump forward too much? It, it is a part of the composition of this painting. So when I do a signature shortly, I've got to really consider that. A bit more on these. I never sign mine. Well, hopefully after this show today, you'll be not producing any more rubbish. It'll be great paintings from now on. <laughs> Well, it just give you ideas, like I say. It's, um, if you came as the group, how would you sort of tackle the group of if you wanted me for a, a, abilities? Yeah. Workshop. Um, yeah, for a full day. Right. Yeah. How would you tackle that? There, there are several ways to go about. Say, for instance, you came as a group to me at the garden for the day. Yeah. Um, I would do one or two demos, and I would constantly work with each of you. And if I had to, I would demonstrate with each and every one of you. I prefer not to work or touch your paintings. Occasionally I will just to show you something just quickly and smartly go over it. But normally I'll go around everywhere. It takes a bit of time. But to start off with a demo in some areas that you want, maybe it would be using acrylic ink and, and pastel to show how to do some uh, very bright work there. I'd let you borrow sets of my pastels to try. If in my classes somebody wants to try something new as they are now with the acrylic inks, I always let them try something first of my materials and then you can buy them later yourselves. You can't be expected to go and buy something you don't know whether you're going to like or not, can you? So, you know, I will bring lots of materials and have them there with me. It's easier when I'm at the other end because I've got all the stuff there. But you decide on the sort of theme you want. I mean, I know this chap you're doing now has asked you to look at these various pictures. Yeah. I would rather you had your own stuff, but if working in the gardens, that's easier. Yeah. Yeah. I do when bring... When you say own stuff, you mean... Yeah, um, your own resource. Yeah. 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 So if you're working on the gardens and you'd be working yeah. around the gardens, it's a problem if I was working here. Let's see if I can get it done in one go. I can make a botch of this and put it out of the way to the rest of my hand. I want something fairly warm, I think, though, and dark. So, again, without using a mild stick, very useful. You know what a mild stick is, don't you? Most of you, yeah, there's a stick that you lean across, you can rest on it. But you can use your arm like this as well, it's the same way. Um, so, and if you want a little flourish, well, that's fine. Just uh, six years at Burton Agnes, uh, Savannah University, quite a few places, New Zealand and so on. Um, great fun for, for the residences. Um, but I also do crits, and I also do judging art exhibitions. And I'm very thorough in that, but I hope to be very sensitive, because I don't do a crit, I do a positive assessment. I come along, and you have your work, and I look at that work, and I will find every good thing I can about it. Don't tell me you can't find something, because I will. I find all the good things, and then I will say, right, in my opinion, and it is only my opinion, and I've, I wrote up recently in, in, in a, 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 there was a, the Country File one, in the, the Country File photographic competition, and some people were really, really bitchy, you know, oh, he must have copied this, oh, he used graphics, oh, he did that, oh, he posed that. Oh, come on, you guys, it's sour grapes. Mm -hmm. Enter next year, and somebody will choose your work, maybe. A different uh, judge will choose differently every year. So um, I look at the work and I say, right, in my opinion, you might improve it by this. Take it or leave it. You know, I will try and add on to what you could do better with your work, having said all the good things about it. When I judge an exhibition, I go around everybody's work, whether it's 60 people or not, and as I judge them, I make a note. And I leave those notes there at the end for everybody to see. Because I am an artist like you, and I care. I get joy from teaching, I get joy from seeing you succeed, it gives me great pleasure, and if you fail, or you're miserable, like Catherine's a snow at the moment, it affects me, she's plastering snow on like bird droppings at the minute, <laughs> can I get that back of it? Um, you know, I'm affected because I care about you having fun and enjoying, and I love demonstrating, I love seeing you enjoy. So I write a comment about every single person's work, and I say why I chose the ones I did, which doesn't mean to say that the rest are any less, does it? You know, when we have these exhibitions judged, winner, gold, merit, whatever, and that's it. Everybody else thinks I'm rejected. But the way I do it, nobody's rejected. You all get your positive comments. And I think that's fair. And I think somebody judging should have respect for you and your art, the same as hopefully you have for mine, the work. 
But you know, it can make or break your paintings having the wrong mount or frame on. I hand tint all my own, which is you know, was in fashion more than now. That way I get the colours that I think suit the painting. A frame should be enhancing. A frame shouldn't be seen, it's to enhance the colours within, as is a mount. If you can see the frame and it stands out too much, it might be a part of that work of art you're doing. But I mean, you know, um, the French are way behind us. They're so up their own when I was I lived over there the past nine years, and they're still into great big gilt frames, and you know, we passe for us years ago. Uh, now mounting's the same, and on the DVDs and videos I've done, and if you can't afford to buy or you don't want at the moment, there's a lot of my stuff free. I have a hundred and something odd films on YouTube. Full films, the, the latest one I put on free for you to see because it's not just about money, it's not about money at all. I've got to survive like anybody. Um, but you know, it's for giving pleasure. And the latest film of three hours of, in, in Cuba is on YouTube, free for you to see. Um, but the, the, on those I've shown you, on YouTube, I show you how to make mounts. I've got a mount cutter at home, it's part of the lessons. You can come and do anything you want with me from mount cutting to frame making to wood carving to lathe work to pottery. It's all there. And mounting is vital, and I've actually shown on that latest film um, two paintings with about 15 different coloured mounts, inner and outer, to show just how much those colours can affect a painting. They really can. Fun. And I can get away with almost these two mounts for nearly everything nowadays, because mounted card is so expensive, and you know. Now's your question time. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm going to do while you're asking questions, hopefully you will, is I'll just... Was that the better mount or that one? I don't know yeah, I, it should be. I'll just a couple of meters. Um, she was against this fish tank in Plymouth. You can imagine, you know, there she is in front of the glass, and this dimension against the new world, all the fish coming up to her behind, and you've got these different dimensions, which is what I was telling you there. And the triptych I've just done with the top of the fish, the gold leafing I put into metallic foiling, actually into the surface of the water above us. And that then, as you move past the painting, the gold is glistening, so it's like the water glistening, and you know, you're going one stage further. Come see me with anything you want. You know, just say that if you want to turn up, you're all right, but normally just give me a bell. If you want to come and see the gallery, what I'm doing, see where we are, what I'm offering, what the paintings. Thanks. It depends. Apparently, you only have, even for patron things, it only has to be a slight, a slight change. A yeah. slight change, because um, when my, my, my son was doing. Something somebody uh, tried to say that he copied. Was Can I just ask you about pencil marks? Yeah. Do you ever have any left on the paper, and if so, what do you do with them? I if any very so, they seem to just disappear normally. Uh, pencil marks, as in the China graph pencil, well, of course, you know, that's meant to be there.